The United States is marking the 14th anniversary of the September 11th attacks today. Three weeks after the World Trade Center and Pentagon were attacked, the U.S. launched airstrikes in Afghanistan, beginning what would become the longest war in American history. The U.S. military recently reopened a criminal investigation into some of the most serious allegations against U.S. forces in Afghanistan since 2001, involving the murder of at least 17 Afghan men in Wardak province, west of Kabul, in 2012 and 2013. Eight Afghans were killed during U.S. military operations, while several disappeared after having been arrested by special forces in Nerk. Their bodies were later uncovered just outside the U.S. base in the area. Afghan military investigators had concluded at the time that a U.S. Special Forces unit known as the A-Team was responsible. The U.S. military command in Afghanistan conducted multiple investigations, each of which exonerated the unit. For the first time, one of the Afghan men detained by U.S. Special Forces in Nerk has decided to speak out on camera. His name is Kandi. He was held for nearly a year and then released without charge. They came to my house and arrested me in front of my guests. They brought me straight to the Afghan army base, and from there they took me to the American base. They took me alone to a cell inside the base made of plywood, like they use for doors. The Americans were there. They were together. They said I was with the enemy. And they had information that I had weapons. At 10 at night, they came with the cables. They started hitting me all over. They also bound my testicles, and they took my clothes except for my pants. They threw water on me. At this point in the night, they beat me very badly on my feet and on my hands. They took my shirt and beat me with cables. Yes, sir, I saw with my own eyes that they killed people. That video was produced by Matt Akins and Bethany Matt for The Nation. Um, Matt Akins first reported on the massacre in Afghanistan in a 2013 Rolling Stone article headlined, The A-Team Killings. His latest piece for The Nation is headlined, U.S. Special Forces May Have Gone on a Murder Spree in Afghanistan. Did the Army Cover It Up? Well, last week, Nermeen Sheikh and I sat down with Matt Akins. I started by asking him to explain what he first revealed in that piece. Well, what we first exposed was the actual unit that was there. You know, there had been these allegations, there had been protests by locals saying that this mysterious U.S. Army unit and its translators was killing people and torturing them. Um, but, you know, this being the Special Operations Forces, they're shrouded in a lot of mystery. And uh, the U.S. military had, of course, denied and claimed they had done these investigations exonerating themselves. So what we did was we actually went in and did enough interviews and eventually tracked down one of the translators for this unit who had been arrested and put in an Afghan prison. And uh, by doing that, we have actually found out what unit it was. It was an A-team of U.S. Army Special Forces, ODA 3124, that had been based there. Mm. And describe uh, what happened to Kandi and his connection. Well, Kandi was picked up by U.S. forces in November 2012. Uh, he was, you know, one of many men who were rounded up by this unit. Now, everything that we he says after that is based on his own testimony, but it's consistent with many other witnesses that we also spoke to. He says he was taken to this base, accused of being an insurgent um, and tortured, you know, beaten with cables, sexual torture. He was subjected to mock drownings, um, threatened with death, of course, many times. And what's interesting is that he was actually in Bagram prison, so he spent 45 days there, he says, and then was transferred to Bagram which is the main U.S. detention facility in Afghanistan, or was at the time. And so when we did this investigation, he wasn't available. He was in Bagram. But he actually said that he had, to the Red Cross and to his relatives who visited him in prison, he said that he had witnessed murders. He had seen um, some of the disappeared men beaten to death by these special forces and their Afghan translators with his own eyes. So after he was released, a year later, without charges from Bagram, we tracked him down and got his story, and what he told us was pretty horrific. So I want to go to another part of uh, the nation's interview with Kandi. Here he talks about a na man named Sayyid Muhammad. Kandi also explains what he saw of the treatment of Afghan prisoners. 
They brought Sayyid Muhammad before sunset, and they killed him before it was dark. They didn't keep him there long. The others spent three nights or four nights with me. As soon as they brought him, they started beating him. They would straddle the prisoner and start beating him. From this side, the Afghan translators would strike with cables and their feet, and the Americans would beat on the head. They had blue or green eyes and long red beards. That was an excerpt from the video produced by our guests, Matt Akins and Bethany Mata for The Nation. So, Matt, could you talk about what Gandhi uh, says? He was picked up by special forces. When he says they, that's who he's referring to. U.S. special forces picked him up, and specifically this. Was it the A-team who picked him up? And then also you point out in the piece that what happened in Nech, the Nech killings, stand out in the course of this, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, despite the fact that the U.S. military was often accused of human rights abuses. So what was it about what happened in Nech that distinguishes it from past uh, uh, such incidents? Yeah, well, Kandi identified the unit that picked him up as a special forces unit that was based at the time in Nurk. And of course, the U.S. military would know that because he was subsequently transferred to Bagram, so they would have records of exactly who picked him up. Um, as for this incident itself and why it stands out, you know, in a war that's marked with so many war crimes committed by U.S. forces, Afghan forces, and of course the Taliban as well. Um, I think there's three reasons. First, the gravity of what happened. We're talking about torture and murder of at least 17 people, uh, disappearances, right, often of people who were rounded up in broad daylight. Second, we're not talking about some deranged soldier here, right? We're not talking about Sergeant Robert Bales, for example, who went crazy and killed 16 Afghans, civilians, in the course of a night. We're talking about an elite U.S. military unit that conducted this over a sustained period of time as part of their operations. Uh, and finally, there's the question of why the U.S. military did three investigations uh, without finding anything, exonerating itself, given that, you know, everything that's subsequently come to light through, you know, reports like my own, through the Red Cross's investigation, through the U.N.'s investigation, uh, as well as now the fact that there's a criminal investigation. How could they have done three investigations, uh, not found anything, without someone covering it up? Let's turn to another part of the interview that you did with Kandi, where he describes how he was transferred to Bagram Air Base. They changed my clothes in that base. It was 11.30 at night. They took me in a helicopter to the car. When they took me out of the car, I could feel the wind of the rotors. It was very cold, but I couldn't hear anything. Four people picked me up by my arms and legs and put me in the helicopter and took me to Bagram. That was an excerpt, again, from the video produced by Matt Aikens, the award-winning reporter in Bethany Mata for The Nation, um, as he describes what happened to him and when he was brought to Bagram. This very official, as you say, this is all on the record. The U.S. was running the space. And the investigations you're talking about of the A-team, this isn't back during the George Bush era. This is well into um, President Obama's tenure as president of the United States three investigations in a series of months. Why now, a few years later, have they reopened this investigation? Well, that's actually a very good question. We don't know at the moment why it's been reopened specifically, but obviously in the case review process where this sort of goes up the chain of command, they thought that the original investigation had overlooked something that it needed a second look. Um, so in that sense, it is kind of encouraging. At least the process isn't dead. You know, in many of these cases, uh, has been documented, for example, in a recent Amnesty International report, there just is no follow-up whatsoever when there's clear evidence of, you know, violations of laws or by U.S. forces. It's no surprise, because the U.S. military sort of, you know, investigates itself and, you know, is responsible for holding itself accountable. There's not an independent prosecutorial mechanism within the military justice system. It's controlled by the commanders uh, of the men who are basically being charged. Well, I mean, Amnesty International, in that report, also raises some concerns and has issued a statement recently, after they said that this case was going to be reopened, that it's still the military that is investigating the case. So the same concerns that existed before exist now. In other words, why wouldn't they simply exonerate the team again? That, why can't the military be tried by a civilian court? Because that's just not how the laws of the United States work. The military has its own uh, jurisdiction. 
over violations of the laws of war. Um, and so, in this case, it's really up to the military. Now, there is a sort of independent uh, criminal investigation command that's handling this, and it's not like uh, they've they're going to just cover this up, especially when it's gotten to this level. But, you know, two years into it, uh, the evidence, for example, has really gone cold in a lot of cases. And you got to wonder, you know, when I did this original report, uh, which came out, you know, in the end of 2013, none of the witnesses that I had spoken to had ever been uh, interviewed by the U.S. military investigators. And it wasn't until, you know, that winter that they finally began talking to people, almost a year after it happened. Matt, I want to ask you about the one person who has been prosecuted in connection uh, with these killings. His name is Zikria, and you're one of the few journalists, or perhaps only ones, who's met him. Can you talk about this person? Yeah, he was someone who came up fairly early on uh, in these incidents. He was accused by locals uh, of torturing them, of executing people. Uh, and then he sort of fled. A video emerged of him beating um, the man, Syed Mohammed, whose body uh, you showed, showed earlier, whose body was found outside the Special Forces base. So he was kind of a figure of mystery in the beginning. The U.S. military really disavowed him, said he wasn't an actual, you know, paid interpreter. And supposedly the Special Forces team said, oh, no, he escaped, and we, we don't know anything about him. Um, when he was arrested later on by the Afghan intelligence service and sent to prison, that's when I, I met with him. And he told me that he was had been working multiple tours with the U.S. military uh, as a paid interpreter and had carried a weapon with them. And he blamed the killings and, and the torture on, actually, the Special Forces guys. He said he didn't do it, even though there's many witnesses who say that he did. Uh, he named specific members uh, of the Special Forces, he named specific soldiers, and said, no, it was them. They're responsible. Um, so he's the only person who's really been convicted to date in connection with these incidents, and he has placed the blame on the Americans that he worked for. And he's received, what, 20 years in prison? What's received, his sentence? He's received 20 years in prison for treason, which is interesting. Uh, rather than murder or any of these, you know, alleged uh, crimes, I think the Afghan government did not want to go much deeper into it. I think they wanted to kind of shove it under the corner. Um, so— And wouldn't the U.S. government want him put away as well, since he has information? Well, he's there. He's actually been transferred to Bagram, which is now under Afghan control. So, if they wanted to get, you know, information from him or meet with him, it'd be very easy for them to do so. So, by your estimation, how many people died as a result of the A team and the killings that they were engaged in? We know of at least 17 individuals by name from that area. And what do you think this says about um, the elite, elite special forces like the A-Team and how they operated in Afghanistan? Do you think it's likely, for instance, Amnesty raised the question um, of whether there are many more incidents like this uh, of abuses by the U.S. military that we may or may not know of? Well, what happened in this case is shockingly extreme. Um, but, for example, when I talked to Zikria, uh, sorry, and other translators who knew him, who had worked with the same unit, they said he had killed people before in previous deployments in Uruzgan province with the same unit, killed prisoners. Um, I think this case raises very serious questions about what kind of oversight and accountability there are for these elite units that are working out, you know, in remote and dangerous areas on their own, that have been through, you know, eight or nine or ten deployments uh, in some of the most brutal parts of uh, Afghanistan. And, whether or not this kind of torture and extended, you know, interrogations and just the practices that have been unearthed in this case are, in fact, more widespread than we'd like to know. Where is the A-team now? As far as I know, they've been um, back to the U.S. and they're in Fort Bragg, which is the home of the Special Forces. Mm -hmm. Are the names of the officers or soldiers who were named by Zikria, are those public? We decided to go public with a few of the names who were named specifically by Zikria and other individuals, people who held key positions of responsibility um, within the unit, which was a controversial decision. We were asked by the military not to publish their names, but, you know, they're uh, civil s servants. They're, they're part of the U.S. government um, representing America overseas. And we felt in this case that it was essential um, for purposes of accountability to, to name the, the key members. So, what do you think, in your view, what's the best outcome of this reopened investigation? Um, the best outcome would be a transparent and accountable uh, process. So, you know, whatever they decide, they need to be clear and public about why they decided it. And, of course, that won't happen. These 
um, proceedings, unless they actually reach a court-martial stage, uh, are never made public. You can try to force it out of them through freedom of information requests, which we will certainly do. Um, but and that's another, you know, major flaw in the military justice system, is that it has a complete lack of transparency. Do you think and that some members of this A-team should be brought up on charges of murder and tried? That's not really something for me to decide. You know, I think that it's clear in this case that there is a very strong evidence that crimes were committed. Uh, there are dead bodies being recovered outside the base. Uh, what should happen is there should be a thorough investigation and that, you know, if there is evidence, then people should be charged. We are in October, moving into the 15th year of the war in Afghanistan. Um, are operations like you exposed with the A-team continuing? They are not continuing the same way. Um, because you don't have the same military footprint. So I don't think there are isolated special forces units living on remote fire bases like you had at the time. But definitely there's still extensive uh, U.S. military involvement in the war. Um, you just had two special forces members who were killed uh, in Helmand province last week uh, in a friendly fire incident because they were trying to, you know, um, fight the Taliban, which, again, is not really what the uh, authorization for President Obama's current troop deployments are. It's supposed to be training a mission and, and going after al-Qaeda. But it's clear that 15 years in, the U.S. is still fighting a war in Afghanistan. Award-winning journalist Matt Akins. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh.